Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we've had a very exciting time so far. This is our first of our breakout sessions. And uh, I'm glad to see everyone is here on time. That's a great start. Um, on behalf of the, my friends at Microsoft Research, I really want to uh, thank FAPESPI. What a great partner fapespi has been uh, in putting together this event. And it's uh, very exciting for me. Our topic today is data visualization. You know, that's fundamental to the entire e-science area. I think it probably was clear from some of our discussions this morning that uh, data visualization is, is a key element. And our first speaker is Rob DeLine from uh, Microsoft Research. You know, there's, there's something about Rob. You can see something about people, about how they describe their world around them. And uh, in fact, the way he describes the world is from uh, the viewpoint of the person doing things. And that's the way he approaches his research also, if I understand correctly. And so in his talk, um, he uh, makes a comment, a goal is to make it easier to produce usable, reliable software as a general goal of his group and of the things he cares about. And of course, today's topic is related to that, but in the whole area of visualization. So please come around. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I know this is the talk slot right after lunch, so I'll make you a deal. If you'll try to stay awake, I'll try to stay awake too. Um, yes, yeah, so as Harold was saying, um, let me give you a brief introduction to how I approach research because I know we have a very uh, large variety of backgrounds in the room. Um, so I work at the intersection of uh, human computer interaction and software engineering, which are two fields of computer science. Um, and generally what I do is I study um, how people go about doing technical work. So I observe them, I interview them, and so on. And then I try to improve uh, how they do that technical work. So I try to make it less frustrating, less error prone, um, easier for them to do. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how I've been doing that with data scientists. Um, so about a year ago, actually a little more than a year ago now, a group of colleagues and I started um, engaging with data scientists as kind of a set of users, as a set of customers for us. Um, and uh, how we got started with that was with a set of interviews. So we did uh, interviews uh, with 16 data scientists which were, um, published about a year ago in Interactions Magazine. And we intentionally tried to interview a very wide variety of data scientists because this is an emerging role. So what, what is a data scientist? I mean, there are lots of definitions for that right now. Um, so some of the people that we interviewed are very much traditional scientists. So they're people that are doing, say, climate modeling um, because they're ecologists or some of them are biologists. Um, some of the people we talked to were computational social scientists. So they were doing data mining of the Twitter firehose to try to understand human behavior by uh, analyzing tweets. Um, some of the people that we talked to uh, were more from an engineering or commercial point of view. Uh, so some of them were um, software engineers who were trying to mine the data associated with software projects in order to make the teams more efficient or help their error rate or help their costs, that kind of thing. Um, and then some people were just uh, working on product teams. Um, so one of the fun groups to talk to was a, a group of data scientists working on games. Um, in fact, this graphic that I put on my title um, is a graphic that we got from the Halo 3 um, team. Uh, at Microsoft, and uh, this was a visualization they produced for themselves where they took a map of a certain game level in Halo 3 and they started plotting where different players uh, playing the game were dying. 
and getting frustrated as a result because they couldn't make it through that level. Um, and as a result of seeing this map, they look and they said, aha, we now have this insight. There's this one terrible red area where everybody is getting shot in this game and not having fun. So we'll rearrange things in the game a little bit so they can survive longer and go on to, to play a little bit more. Um, so there's actually quite a wide variety um, to what data scientists do. But what we found is that their work practice, the day-to-day -day activities of how they were gathering data, analyzing it, making decisions based on it, was actually quite similar. Um, and so what is that work practice actually like today? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's like this. Um, so the way that people analyze large data sets today is very much like the mainframe era was 30 years ago in terms of developing software. And, and I don't mean to be, this to be insulting in any way. I mean, that's just where the state of the tools are right now. And specifically why I say this reminds me of the mainframe era is that the list of complaints that data scientists had about their work um, were very much the kinds of complaints that you would have heard 30 years ago. Um, so were, they were things like, importing data into the system is very difficult. Basically, you know, the system is in control, you have to meet the rules of the system, the data doesn't come first. Um, one of the largest complaints they had is just the fact that the processing engine they were using, things like Hadoop, for example, or Azure, are geared to be these kind of big batch operating systems. So people will submit an analysis job, and then they'll wait hours for the job to actually get scheduled, and then they'll wait even more hours for their script to run and their computations to run and, and to get some output. And heaven forbid, you should have made a typo in your script because now you're gonna wait for many hours just to get back an error message that says, whoops. Um, or they'll wait many hours to see the very first graph and they'll realize, oh, I, me I meant you know inner join, not outer join, oh no, and then they have to start over again. Um, so it's very slow. Um, a lot of the work now is done very clerical fashion. You have to sort of output files from one tool and then pass that into a different tool from a different uh, tool supplier. Um, so it's very kind of careful uh, clerical work. And the worst part about such clerical work is it's easy to make mistakes. So a lot of people believe in things like carefully tracking provenance, so keeping very careful records of how you went from the raw data through all the different transformations to how you got the final result. But today, there's no help for that. You just have to be extremely careful. Um, and then the last couple of complaints we heard is that the nature of the work is very exploratory. So people want to do this in a very iterative fashion. But by having these kind of long batch kind of tools, it's hard to be interactive and iterative. It's hard to be exploratory. And then finally, visualization is really key. People want to see visualization basically at every single step of their work, um, but it takes, it takes uh, um, effort. I mean, you basically have to learn a plotting library or you have to learn a plotting tool or this kind of thing, and you have to put a lot of effort into visualization. Um, okay, so we heard this long list of complaints and we thought, okay, well, we can work on that, we can fix that. Um, so uh, for the past year, a uh, group, a uh, very multidisciplinary research group uh, at Microsoft Research has been working on a tool um, called Big Sky. Um, and Big Sky is um, intended to be kind of one-stop shopping for data scientists doing their work. So in the same way that if you're familiar with programming, programmers today will use something like Visual Studio or they'll use Eclipse as kind of the one environment that they do pretty much all of their work in. So we want to build the equivalent thing for data scientists. That's what Big Sky is. Um, so let me walk you through some of the features here. Um, and I'll say in advance that uh, I have a demo tonight at the Demo Fest. So if you'd like to see it in more detail or you'd like to ask me to do this, that, or the other, I'm happy to, to do that later. Um, so a few things. So the first thing to notice is this is a web browser. So the whole thing is web hosted. There's no download or anything. Uh, everything is in the cloud. So all the storage of data is in the cloud and all the computation takes place in the cloud. Um, all of the content, um, much like any website, all of the content that's on this website is just shared by default. Now, of course, we believe in security and you authenticate yourself and there are permissions to see this data set but not that one. 
but by default we encourage sharing. Also, it's a collaborative environment. So if two people go simultaneously to the same web page, they will see the same content. In fact, they'll see it updated live. So if you want, you can work in a coordinated fashion um, with colleagues on the same um, kind of workflow. And then finally, um, all of your interactions with, with Big Sky and with your data um, are automatically recorded. So this makes things like preserving provenance kind of come for free. So as soon as you've imported your data, every single step you take with it from then on is recorded. So we know exactly what you've done with the data, and so it makes it much easier to reproduce. Um, in terms of the overall user experience, um, we're very much using the metaphor of a research notebook of the kind that res researchers already tend to keep. Um, so uh, on the left hand side here is a set of notebooks. Uh, the notebook con consists of pages and then sort of one page is active and shown at a time. Um, each page can have heterogeneous content, very mixed content. So this particular page has a data set which is uh, I got from Kaggle.com about the passengers on the Titanic. Um, and then right below it is a script um, that processes that particular data set. Um, and so we want the notebook page to basically consist of all the different transformation steps that you did, all the different data sets that you touched, kind of all together in one place. Uh, in fact, in this morning's keynote, you heard uh, Tony Hay mention kind of this new publication model that you know a published paper should have a second paper that goes with it that kind of gives you all the data and explains exactly what steps were done and would be interactive and allow you to try alternatives, et cetera. Well, we very much hope that Big Sky is a candidate for exactly that kind of publication mechanism. We would hope that a Big Sky URL is something you could publish in your paper and then readers of it who want to know more can simply go to that web page. Uh, and then finally, let me point out um, a couple of the design features that we think are important here. Um, so one is that, um, as you can tell, visualization is very much pervasive in this design. Basically, every step that you take, we try to produce useful visualizations just for free as part of uh, doing that interaction. So you can see when I imported my data, for example, we just automatically draw a histogram of the distributions of the data in that column because that's the kind of thing a data scientist is just going to do right away as a first step anyway. So we'll just do it for you for free so you don't have to worry about it. Um, uh, and uh, there are other kinds of calculations that we try to do as well for free. So for example, uh, if a data scientist is looking at unknown data, often the first thing they want to figure out is, well, what kind of measure is this? Is this, is this uh, a continuous real value? Is it categorical data? That kind of thing. So here you can see for several of the columns, we figured out that this is categorical data, even though in some cases it happens to be numeric. So things like the survival rate or the sex. Um, and then finally, another very common first step people do is they look for missing values. And again, this is sort of a thing you get for free. I mean, as soon as you import your data into the system, you know, you can see the little orange box there. It's probably too small to read, but it says something like 177 missing values and that's a certain percentage of the overall data set. Um, so let me say, uh, so the intention here is that you'll load in some data sets and then you'll start writing some scripts to start uh, processing that data. Let me say a little bit about the scripting. Um, so the scripting is very much like any scripting environment you might be familiar with, like R, MATLAB, that kind of thing. Um, so it's got sort of a read eval print loop, um, but with some differences. Um, so one difference is that whenever you get a response from the system, that response is not a print string, it's a visualization. So here I've done a sort of query that looks very much like SQL and I get back a table. So it draws a table. The next line of script that I did is looking at a set of numbers. So here we do a histogram to show you the distribution of those numbers. And then finally, the third script command that I've done here um, I've asked to fit a linear regression model. So the response that I get from the system is a full scatter plot um, showing the line that I get back, the confidence intervals around the line, and then we even draw the residuals for you. And then again, this is in a way trying to support best practices. You know, the, 
uh, standard statistical technique is that, you know, or advice is that you're supposed to look at your residuals whenever you do linear regression plot. People often forget what the command is for that, so they forget to do it or whatever. Here we just do it for free. We, in effect, make it, we make it harder to do the wrong thing than to do the right thing. And that's, that's kind of one of the design principles. Um, so I wouldn't really call this a read eval print loop. It's really sort of a read eval visualized loop. But in effect, but in effect, we're going to uh, make all these visualizations interactive because we'd really like it to be a read eval explore loop. So every uh, data item you produce, we'd like you to be able to like fully explore it in an interactive direct manipulation way. Um, one quick detail, I'm in fact lying to you. It's not a read eval print loop at all. It's actually something called a live script. So I can actually edit the script document any place I like. So for example, if I go and switch the male in my query to female, we just automatically update all results that depend on that query um, to keep them kind of live and up to date. So um, it's actually a little bit nicer than a classic read eval print loop. Um, now all the data sets that I've shown you here um, are in fact extremely tiny. So what about big data? Um, so the way that we deal with big data is that we deal with it through um, what we call progressive streams. So every time you touch a piece of data, we automatically start streaming that data and show you progressively what's going on. So there I just imported a large data set, 1.67 row, million rows just went by. And here I can already start scripting against that data set even as it's coming in. And again, the script that I write executes progressively. So I can see the results even as they're happening. So no, no more of this like batch system kind of thing where you wait for hours. Um, since I have your attention and since some of my colleagues couldn't travel with me to be here, I thought I'd give you just a few quick pointers to other visualization projects that are relevant to this community that are going on at Microsoft Research. Just to give you a little taste um, and then you can visit our website to find out more. Um, so one of these projects uh, is called Sandance, and it's about doing large-scale visualization um, with this really clever technique where basically they use one pixel for each data point in the set. And one of the reasons besides scalability why that's interesting is that it allows these very nice transitions between different kinds of queries. So you can go back and forth between maps and different kinds of histograms and so on very easily because the particles that represent your data just kind of flow around. Um, another project is called Sketch Insight. And this one is about trying to make um, basically data exploration and data presentation be uh, much more intuitive and natural, particularly for, say, business people who don't necessarily have a great background in analysis or, or other kinds of end users who don't have much of, a, of analysis. So here, Vangshin is showing off some of the presentation aspects of this tool where you can sketch um, very personalized kinds of presentations of the data um, of the kind that's very popular in these internet memes you probably see in your Facebook feed and this kind of thing, this kind of storytelling around data that people do. And then the third pointer that I will make is to uh, the work of Natalie Riesch, um, where she spent the last couple of years actually working side by side with neuroscientists. Um, the neuroscientists are very interested in the connectivity of brain cells. Now this is a huge challenge for information visualization as an academic field uh, because traditional InfoViz you know, works with graphs of say hundreds of nodes, maybe thousands of nodes. But of course the neuroscientists want graphs of millions or tens of millions of nodes, right? So this is several orders of magnitude more complicated than InfoViz is traditionally done with and Natalie Riesch is sort of ambitiously attacking this problem. Okay, so with that, I will end and just remind you that I will be giving a Big Sky demo um, at uh, DemoFest, so please come and see me. With that, I'll take questions. Uh, where can we download your presentation from? Um, I, my understanding is that it will be available on the uh, workshop's website.
Um, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, we have uh, some problems with um, visualize more than two objectives or three objectives in um, evolutionary algorithms, for example. Um, is there some way to, um, um, to make them understand, uh, to visualize solutions for genetic algorithms that has more than three objectives, for example? Um, well, let's see, that's a very specific question. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, so that's a visualization problem that I have not worked on uh, before. Um, but if you like, you can give me some examples of that uh, afterwards, okay. and then uh, I, can, I can help try to find at least pointers to other researchers who have worked on similar things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the uh, lecture. Uh, I would like to, to know if the biggest Kai software is open or it's... Uh, it is not yet. So uh, actually this week we are giving Big Sky to its first customer. We're really excited about that. I've been spending a lot of the workshop in a corner fixing bugs actually because we're trying to ship to the first customer this week. Um, so. Uh, as we make more progress um, and have more experience with customers, eventually we do want to make this um, available completely publicly and open. Um, like I said, it really is my ambition that one day people could publish papers where they have sort of a big sky URL included as part of their paper because it's simply you know, part of our infrastructure uh, that people can share. So yeah, I very much want to go public with it. Uh, no, I cannot. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, uh, so what we're going to do is over the next, say, six months or a year, we're going to be working with Microsoft product teams as our customers, basically because they're convenient. They're nearby. If they have a complaint, they can come, you know, choke us, and we're easy to find. Um, and then after that, we're hoping to go public with it. Yeah. Six months. Six months or a year, something like that. Yeah, that's my, that's my estimate. Thanks. You mentioned that you'd developed your own scripting language. Is that correct? Uh, no. Um, so the scripting language is C Sharp um, oh, okay. with its uh, link feature. Um, and link is actually one of the reasons that we wanted to use C Sharp because it has this nice sort of SQL-like syntax for doing queries. Um, I must also say that I'm, um, I'm not especially loyal to any particular uh, scripting language. I'm pretty open to anything that a data scientist tells me is useful. Because my uh, data scientists all are R. They're, they're an R shop. Uh, and they're not going to go to C sharp, sorry. I, so I just I, wondered I'm if there you. was a way of I'm with you 100%. So um, uh, I love and hate R. Um, I think everybody feels that way about R. One of the reasons why I hate R is because the uh, this is probably going to bore most people, but the licensing associating with R is an absolute nightmare. Um, R consists of a million little fragments, all separately licensed, some GPL, some not, et cetera. That makes it untouchable for me in the corporate world. Um, I'm, that's just the reality. One thing I am excited about, however, is Julia. Do you know about Julia? It's a successor language to R, so the R community made up a new language to kind of try to fix some of the semantic issues with R, and they put it under the MIT uh, license, which makes it completely open for me. So I'm very excited about Julia. Okay, just the last question. Uh, what advice do you have for us? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I, I guess my usual advice, um, so uh, this would be perhaps, I don't know how good a fit this audience is, or my advice is for this audience, but I'm a tool maker and I'm used to talking to audiences of other tool makers and my advice to any tool maker is be as close to your customer as possible, you know, sit side by side with your customer, you know, your user so to speak, um, you know, spend as much time with them as possible, really understand their life. 
um, because then they might actually use your tool because it will be a fit for what they do. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay, while she's setting up, um, our next speaker is uh, Chris, Christina Oliveira, and she's coming to talk to us about challenging multidimensional data. And um, her focus in general, her research focus in general, is scientific visualization and information visualization. And it's a very appropriate topic for a workshop about turning data into insight. I'm, uh, I'm from uh, University of Sao Paulo at São Carlos at ICMC and uh, you've been hearing a lot about uh, e-science and when I have to talk uh, what is e-science to lay people, I, used to, uh, I, I like this example because I think it's very appealing to all of us, which is, uh, well, we all know that, or by now you know, that uh, e-science has to do with data processing, data mining, data visualization, data handling in general. Uh, but then what we want is actually to be able to uh, get intelligence from our data, right? So, uh, for example, when you go to the doctor and uh, you have some symptom and uh, she uh, says she has a uh, hypothesis that your thyroid may not be working properly. So she ask for a blood test, and uh, she uh, have your hormones uh, checked, your hormone levels checked, and she ask for that, and that's she get an answer on that. But uh, actually, there is a lot more data in that uh, tiny blood sample of yours that you, she's just ignoring because it's not something that she's looking for. Uh, so ideally, we could have a situation in which, uh, as we are taking your blood, right? So uh, literally, we could say, well, you just tell me anything that it might be useful for me to know about this person based on the information that is in his or her blood, and uh, then get the data records from this person, which might include all sorts of data in different formats, like body scan images, uh, sensors that may be attached to the person at some point, or previous reports and uh, use all this information and actually tell me if there is something or anything that could be useful for me to know at this point considering this situation, right? So that is uh, what this science is about, is actually uh, handling data from heter heterogeneous sources, multiple sources, and analyzing them in, contact, in context so that you make the best possible informed decision on a particular uh, problem or issue. Uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on one particular uh, component of this uh, big picture here, which is abstract data visualization. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll try actually to uh, talk about our experience, my research group's experience on visualizing this abstract data, uh, high dimensional data. Uh, I will illustrate those with one a, a category of, uh, a, a, a specific category of approach for handling high dimensional data. Uh, and uh, then I want to talk a bit about the challenges and uh, actually I'd like to make you uh, very enthusiastic about working on visualization. Uh, so uh, I'll I go for, to a different scenario then, uh, and, and this is a current one, right? Uh, so so I mean, uh, I'm part of this uh, research network in Brazil uh, that has many uh, researchers from domain scientists from several areas, and generally you could call them as uh, material scientists. Uh, they develop sensors, uh, uh, maybe from biologically inspired materials. So these sensors are actually uh, nanomolecular structures, very thin membranes, thin films, and uh, they. Uh, they have techniques to assemble these materials in different ways and so that uh, they, when they interact with other materials, you can actually measure their response and from that learn uh, some things. Uh, 
so there are many techniques to do these measurements. One of them is uh, impedance spectroscopy, which uh, will give you something like this, like these curves here, right? Uh, so you have a range of measurements over a spectrum of frequencies. Uh, and uh, the behavior of these spectra will tell them what's happening in that material. So uh, their problem is actually to design these devices, these sensors. So sensors for what? Uh, for example, one of the problems they've been working on is on this sensor to detect the presence of antibodies, actually to detect Chagas disease or Leishmaniasis in blood samples. So these are uh, two uh, diseases that are identified as neglected diseases because they are typical of tropical uh, countries and impoverished areas. And uh, they cannot be uh, properly diagnosed with current methods. You get lots of uh, false positives for, for both. They get mixed. Or a sensor to detect the presence of phytic acid in very uh, low concentrations. That's something, for example, you don't want to have in our food. Uh, electronic tongues. Uh, uh, sensing devices in general, right? So uh, their work is actually, they test a lot of configurations of these sensors and materials and of the measurements, the way they take the measurements. And uh, it's a very dynamic scenario. And their goal then, their research questions, is uh, either to find us an optimal sensor to solve a particular problem or uh, to optimize an existing sensor. And of course, then they want to understand why this particular solution is good and that one is not so good and so on. Uh, so uh, then uh, we asked them, well, how do you analyze your data? And we learned that uh, they have a very limited repertoire of tools. Or actually, they resort to a very limited repertoire of tools. So, for example, for uh, this particular kind of measurements, uh, what they used to do is they uh, try to guess which is the best frequency in the spectrum that would give the best response, and they throw away all the rest of the data, and they do like a principal component analysis on that uh, particular piece of the, of the data. So actually what they are doing is similar to what uh, we do with our blood samples, right? We are throwing a lot of data away. Uh, and it's not that they can afford to throw the data away, right? It, it's just that they cannot handle the data as they, they get it. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, so then, then I will change to, then what is this dimen high dimensional data, right? So this spectra of them is one example of what uh, I, we call high dimensional data. So this is data that, can, that usually can be described as these uh, uh, vectors, uh, or a, 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 vector, a vector of features could be numeric, but it doesn't have to. And so you have a dimensional embedding of the data. You have this vector representation which each of your data objects is described by a vector. And actually you can get away without actually an explicit representation of your data objects if you can actually uh, uh, com compute their pairwise uh, similarities or dissimilarities. So you, you actually tell how, much, how, how similar uh, a pair of objects are. Uh, and why, uh, why we, I'm talking about similarities? Basically because this, this category of techniques we work on uh, are techniques that generate these uh, point placements, these layouts in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional space of your data trying to uh, preserve somehow in the layout their similarities or their dissimilarities likewise relationships, right? So you generate these layouts that are based on the, the similarity of the objects. Uh, we work with two main classes of techniques which are uh, projection-based techniques uh, or tree-based techniques, so we have an example of each. Uh, so projection-based are basically variations of these approaches known as multidimensional scaling or some other kind of dimension reduction. Uh, and uh, the three base generates a, a hierarchy in which uh, the uh, objects in the same branch are more similar than objects in different branches. That's basically the idea. Uh, so uh, I, I won't be able to talk about those uh, in, in full. I'll just uh, talk a bit about the, the projection approaches. Essentially, the approach is actually to find a mapping function that uh, does this mapping of your data defined in an original high dimensional space to a target low dimensional space, so usually two dimensional, right? You need to have some way to measure similarity in this original space. Uh, you have a, a distance function defined in this uh, visual space, so usually Euclidean uh, mapping. 
and uh, you want a, a mapping function that tries to minimize the error between the original distances or the similarities and the target uh, distances. So uh, basically, uh, th there are many different mathematical approaches to handle this problem, but mo the techniques will try to minimize some sort of uh, a normalized stress function defined in terms of these uh, measures. Uh, and these are examples of techniques that uh, uh, colleagues, uh, I and colleagues from my research group have been working with uh, that have been proposed recently. Uh, and uh, so this is actually not a new idea. It's the idea of uh, generating layouts based on similarities is quite old. So you might ask, well, why do you need new techniques for doing that? Uh, and I'll come to that in a moment, but as I'm saying, our work, so uh, this is the people I work with, this is the visualization and imaging group, and uh, I split us in uh, the visualization people, which is in pink, and the imaging people, but actually, although I've segregated us here, we, are, we work a lot together, so we, we, we are uh, a real group, and we all work on visualization. So, uh, I, as I was mentioning, this is an old idea, but we've been proposing new techniques uh, to handle this problem, why? Uh, basically, because we have nowadays an interact, a, a different scenario in terms of handling data and computer capabilities, so we are searching for techniques that can comply with the requirements imposed by visualization-oriented applications, which it could summarize as we need techniques to be very, very fast, hand large amounts of data at interactive rates. Uh, Handling uh, large data uh, is not only a problem in terms of the computational effort you need, but also in terms of the visual representations. How do you represent this uh, large data uh, properly? And uh, we also want interactivity. And in fact, one, uh, a distinguishing aspect of these recent techniques is that they can actually uh, get information from the user and you can use this information to steer the behavior of the technique so that you can uh, get the most from uh, your data. So these are examples of layouts and in this case the data objects are uh, scientific papers. Uh, well, actually it's scientific papers and, and, and news feeds. Uh, so just for you to have an idea of what kind of uh, layouts you have and also that this is applicable to, to, to different kinds of data. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, later. But then let's get back to our domain scientists, right, the material uh, engineers. So uh, I mentioned to you that they, uh, they use uh, inappropriate tools. So how can these tools be useful to them? So let's consider the problem of this uh, sensor to distinguish leishmaniosis from, uh, from Chagas disease. So uh, in one... Uh, They've started using these visualization techniques to investigate the sensors they've, they've been using. And uh, I have uh, one example of a visualization uh, that uh, we've generated. This has been created with a technique that's not ours. Actually, Samos mapping is a very old technique, dates back from the 60s, late, late 60s. And uh, so here what we see is uh, each of these circles correspond to one spectra for, uh, taken, measured for one particular sample. So they have here eight different types of uh, materials or, uh, or, or analytes, as they call. Uh, actually, they have eight types, and some of these appear at different concentrations. So they have actually 25 different substances. And these, uh, different, the different analytes here they are, they are shown in color. So you have three types of materials here. So they have a, a reference solution, solution, which is this buffer here. They have uh, synthetic samples uh, with uh, antigens for a different uh, kind of disease they are not interested in. They have samples with ant uh, antibodies for leishmaniosis, uh, and, uh, samples with antibodies for Cruzi. These are synthetic. Then they have uh, real blood samples uh, with this, uh, combined, uh, this different disease and then with an antibodies for Leishmania and for Cruzi and uh, one that actually mixture both, uh, antibodies for both. And what this visualization tells them is that this particular sensor configuration is doing a very good job of discriminating between all these different substances because you have this... Uh, separated clusters of, uh, of uh, spectra that, are, uh, that uh, the sensor is being able to clearly separate. Uh, so to get to this uh, 
configuration, they certainly tried several others. So it's, it's an effort actually to be very in this, uh, I mean, the kind of sensors, the kind of, uh, the, kind of the, the type of measurements uh, to find out a, a, an optimum sensor. So this particular solution, uh, the good one, the best one they found was achieved with four sensors. Two of them are, were specific uh, for detecting the antigens for these two uh, diseases, and two of them were not. They were uh, sort of general, which was surprising to them. So actually the combination of the four sensors was actually the best one to differentiate among all these uh, different substances. Uh, so uh, this is uh, my point uh, with visualization, with, uh, of using, in, including visualization and including proper tools in your data analysis, right? Because in particular, visualization can help a lot in situations where you are exploring alternatives and you need uh, flexibility, you need rapid feedback, uh, and uh, that's something we haven't explored in this particular example, but in many situations when you are handling a lot of data, you, data, you also want to uh, give your uh, user the ability to, uh, uh, to, to actually teach the technique the, what you know about the data. So you may, not be, uh, you may not know everything, but you may know a lot of things that might be useful for the techniques uh, generating the visualizations and then for the, the data analysis afterwards. Uh, so uh, you might say, well, but I'm a computer scientist and I'm not particularly interested in working with like materials or things like that. But in fact, this, uh, uh, the nice thing I think about visualization is it's very multidisciplinary. Uh, it's very applied, so you can actually work with uh, domain scientists, scientists in very interesting applications. But also, there is a lot of room for fundamental applications uh, or, or fundamental aspects of computer science that have to be handled so that you have really effective techniques for, for these problems. Uh, and so just to illustrate that you can have other sorts of uh, situations you can use these ideas. So uh, actually this idea of generating uh, visualizations based on global similarity is a very general one, right? It's a very, uh, and it's applicable in many different situations. So in this case, this example here, here is the similarity map, right? And the circles here are actually uh, uh, musics. So uh, this is the, the work of my, my uh, master student, Aurea. She just finished her work. And so she generated these music visualizations. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, 1,300 songs. Uh, she used the MIDI representation, the symbolic representation of the musics. And so she has this similarity-based map. And here the colors actually are mapping the genre uh, of the music, right? So we have uh, the red is uh, uh, rock, pop rock. Uh, the few uh, blue samples here are classical music. And these green ones is what we call in Brazil sertanejo, which is a very dull kind of music. It's green here. And uh, so how she assesses similarity. So you see actually that the map is actually separating the musics by genre. And uh, we, that's not information that we used into the technique. Uh, what is the, uh, so what are the feature vectors? How, how we are describing the music? So what she did is actually to scan the MIDI symbolic representation looking for uh, repetition of certain patterns. So she has compasses uh, and uh, chord repetitions of different lengths. And she maps these chord repetitions into a signal. And then she assesses similarity between these signals to generate the map. And actually, she also uses the signal, she maps the signal to an icon, which is, are these icons, which you see here. So this is uh, music with a lot of variation in this structure. Uh, this is the classical music. Uh, jazz uh, is very much similar to this, uh, the appearance of the icons. These are the pop rock, and this is the sertanejo, the one that I called though. And actually, you see there is a difference in these patterns. And uh, why is this useful for? Well, at this moment, we don't know, actually. That's a good point to discuss. But I think uh, there is a lot of things that we could learn about the, the, the data or the things that we handle in, in our everyday life. And for example, there is many interesting uh, by recommender systems on learning how people like music and how, how can you explain the way uh, the, the personal tastes of people and so on and so forth. So uh, we don't know. So this is very exploratory, right? So we wanted to see, uh, to, uh, see if we could uh, 
uh, see the structure of music, and that's where we got. That's a different application on text, and for text, uh, we have, uh, text is also a challenge. This is actually uh, results from a Google uh, search on the term um, Jaguar features, right? So we have actually 64 snippets uh, rep represented here in the rectangles. The bigger the rectangle, the higher the rank, and actually the layout is grouping the snippets based on their topic similarity. So here on the left I have uh, different models of Jaguar cars in the different colors, and here I have other things about Jaguars, like the animal, there is an old video game, there is an old operating system, other things on Jaguar. So it's a different way of actually seeing your uh, Google uh, hits. And uh, actually we've been working with uh, many other applications in social networks, biological images, volume data, uh, there is a wide range of applications. So what are the challenges? I actually group them in two uh, categories, right? So there are the challenges that are related with the computational aspect of those techniques and of uh, having them properly used. So for example, handling very large data sets is still a challenge. I mean, we do have techniques that handle very large data sets, but it's still not easy. Uh, you always have to find, I mean, uh, what you want to visualize is, uh, the, uh, what you will be able to visualize depends on what, how you are modeling your data, so how you are representing your data, and how do you assess similarity, right? So uh, finding proper representations and uh, similarity evaluation functions is difficult, and it's very, very domain dependent. Uh, which technique, you have several techniques, sometimes uh, uh, you don't actually have many choices of which technique to use, but in many situations you do. So which one do, do you use? Which one do you know that's going to be the best one for that particular kind of data? And of course we are doing dimension reduction, severe one, and this is a very lossy process. So we should be able to actually uh, evaluate, quantify and, and qualify how much information we are losing. That would be important, so that goes towards validation. From the user perspective, then, I think there are other challenges that are not only for computer scientists, like finding better metaphors, uh, learning how people use these visualizations and how they learn from them. That's something we should know in trying to uh, find out these uh, better solutions, because this is all abstract data and then abstract representations. So, uh, what are we, uh, how effective are they actually to give people what they need? Uh, in summary, many, many types of problems and uh, potential applications, and that's an area that uh, requires people with many different skills. Uh, uh, so this work has actually involved several collaborators, uh, both in Brazil and abroad, uh, and I hope I've mentioned all of them here. Uh, I also have some uh, papers that are some, uh, listed here that are somehow uh, related to these things I've been, I've been doing. Uh, and you can also go to our uh, website. And uh, as I said, I'd like to make you enthusiastic about the possibility of working on visualization. So uh, collaborators and uh, students and postdocs are very welcome to contact us. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria, I would like to make a question about the music visualization music, yeah. side. Okay, so uh, blue is classical, red rock and roll, green satanejo. Uh, what does that mean exactly? As I see it, it means that the variety of rhythms and chords in satanejo is much greater than the variety in rock and roll. Is this correct? Uh, in a sense, yes. Actually, what she did was uh, she uses, uh, because MIDI is a symbolic description of the music, right? Yes, I'm, so I'm familiar with So she uses some very basic music theory to identify uh, compasses and then chord sequences, chord repetitions. Mm -hmm. And then she maps these chord repetitions so they have certain lengths, and she maps uh, one particular chord repetition to a color. And uh, so these icons here, they will be more varied when you have deep, more uh, a, a greater number of different kinds of repetitions. Well, That's what that happens, part I have in in Let's see. You're telling me, for instance, that, that the blue icon ha has less, fewer repetitions no, than no, the... No, I'm telling you, for example, here you have a selection of these blue uh, uh, musics which we know are classical music, right? Uh -huh. So actually, she's actually showing a 
detailed representation of these musics that have been selected here. So it's like I'm looking into the music. So I have, say, I don't know how many, maybe 20 musics here. So each line corresponds to a music, mm -hmm. and the, the color uh, in the icons maps these different chord repetitions. Okay. So you have more variety of these repetitions, basic repetitions here, than, for example, in ah, here. Ah, okay, that's clear. That, that's the idea. Uh -huh. But between the certain age group, there's a, 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 a yes, more there is some difference. Variety. Yes, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. there is. Okay, and why is the blue so close to the red? Because you know, there, there's uh, the the classical bass. Uh, there's a famous classical music called Canon and Gigi by Paul Hebel. It's mm. it's 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 said to be the basis of all. Yeah. Uh, uh, rock and roll yeah. music. Well, uh, you, you see, I mean, this placement is very relative. So, in a sense, it makes uh, I mean, it makes sense to me that it's closer to the red than to the green. Uh -huh. But I mean, it, it 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 I don't really know why it's so close. There are other things actually that might may distort things here. For example, you have many more red ones. You had you have many more samples of uh, rock than from from classical. So th that might be distorting as well. Maybe we she used a specific period of classical music because there are n periods. Could you use might baroque, be, yes. romantic? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, because she collects the music from the internet. It's not a very, uh, I mean, it's not a very a structured data set. But we did an experiment in which we added some jazz musics, mm -hmm. and uh, they overlap with the classic. And if okay. you look at the icons, they are sort of more like these than, than like this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Okay, while well, Rob sets up, I have a question. And I think it's relevant to all of us. You know, really, it seems like your area is an area of working with domain experts in general. In this case, uh, maybe you use the internet a little bit as the domain expert to select your music. But in general, you work with individuals. What is some of the advice you can give us regarding beginning a new relationship, working from your particular field with somebody in a different field? What kinds of things? Uh, do you go through what kinds of things do you ask the domain expert in order to begin to help them? Uh, well, I, I think you, you, have, you have to learn how they are doing, uh, their, I mean, what, which, which is their uh, standard approach. And uh, I, I think the, re the recommendation usually to my students who interact with them is uh, be very, very patient and very, very willing to listen and also to explain. And uh, that's, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, I think it's more, uh, in a sense, more severe in Brazil. But I have the impression that our domain scientists in general, there is a big uh, gap in what they are using to analyze their data and they, what they could be using. Uh, if they were, uh, it, it, of course, it, it, I, I do not uh, want to imply that it's their fault. But there is a lot of, uh, there is lack of information on available techniques and tools for computer science for, for many people. So sometimes people just get used to doing things in one way and they go on and they could actually be doing it uh, quicker and uh, more precise, with more precision if they... Uh, so actually both sides have to be willing to learn from the other and, and that requires, I think, uh, a lot of patience because uh, in the beginning, even, uh, I mean, even though you speak the same language, it's, uh, uh, it's a situation in which you, you don't understand what the other is talking, and that lasts some time. And very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So while Rob is setting up, um, I will say something about Rob. I think I should. I've said something about everybody else. Um, first of all, um, okay. he describes his world uh, as a place where he wants to use information in service to environmental research. And I think you'll see in his demonstration, or those of you who attended uh, his tutorial yesterday saw that as well, but that's really his major focus is, is um, how you apply the information to help environmental research. And he's truly a scientist. Um, what he's going to talk about today is data visualization in Layerscape.
Is that me? I think that's me. Uh, maybe we're okay here. Okay, and that's working. Okay, so um, hi, my name is Rob Fotland. I'm with Microsoft Research. And as Harold noted, I work on, uh, oh look, there's a green light on the ceiling. I have to watch that. Uh, I work on technology problems in relationship to environmental science. Now, yesterday I, I uh, was asked to give the morning uh, presentation on using uh, Layerscape and Worldwide Telescope. That took three hours, so uh, for those of you who are here and were at that, then I apologize for a little bit of redundancy, uh, and I'll just have to try and condense three hours into 20 minutes. Um, so I'd like to start out by playing a tour. Earlier today we heard about uh, telling stories around data. That's something that Tony mentioned. Um, so while this is playing, I'll make a couple of comments about where I'm Feel like Harrison Bergeron. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments about where I'm uh, coming from and what we're working on and some of the themes that we encounter when we talk to scientists. As you know, Microsoft Research Connections, Tony Hayes Group, is about reaching out to people in academia and outside of Microsoft and uh, figuring out uh, where we should be placing our emphasis based on real world needs. And in our case, it's real world environmental science research needs. Um, So one of the things that I'm going to talk about is visualization, obviously. Um, as this tour is playing out, you're seeing some of the capabilities of our visualization engine. It's called Worldwide Telescope. Uh, and as I work on environmental science, we kind of created a set of tools that orbit around Worldwide Telescope, and that's collectively referred to as Layerscape. So the naming can be confusing, but Worldwide Telescope was initially conceived of as, as an astronomy tool. It has astronomy data built into it, and it talks to external databases of astronomy data. And then there's a viewing mode switch down here in the lower left, and you can choose to look at planets. You can look at uh, panorama views uh, from taken from Martian rovers, and you can look at um, the solar system, and you can look at the Earth. So we're going to spend some time looking at the Earth. Right now it's looking at the magnetic fields of the sun. Oops. Um, so when you build a data system like this, you sort of build it in two parts. There's what runs locally on your machine, and maybe that's in a browser, or maybe that's a really heavy-duty, powerful piece of software, which hap happens to be the case here. And then you have something that's out in the cloud that you're sort of talking to. And your, your data is sort of distributed amongst yourself and the cloud, but there's really kind of three sources for data. There's what's built into the system natively. So for example, tiles of the earth, these come from Bing Maps. And then there's data that you bring in yourself. For example, these white dots are earthquakes. That's a distribution of earthquakes over time. And of course, the scientists are interested in the earthquakes because they represent the tectonic plate boundaries. So there's a model for the edge of two tectonic plates that are smashing into each other. One of them is subducting down below the other one. And uh, after the se sequence of uh, earthquake animations, it'll go and show the South America plate and the subduction that's going on there. Um, Anyway, the third, so the first is natively what kind of data you have, and then secondly, there's the data that the scientist brings into the systems, data like what we're seeing here, and then the third type of data that you can bring in is something that's provided by another scientist or by another organization, let's say NASA. And so this idea of confederating data systems and having data systems and talk to one another is, is a new way of thinking about how to do research. Because in the past, the model has been, I have my data and I kind of scoop it together. And maybe I know about one other guy who's uh, got data of his own and he goes off and does his stuff, but then we swap by FTP or by thumb drives or something like that. And that's not going to keep up with the data deluge, with this data intensive science that we're, era that we're in. Uh, you, you have to really be able to, um, I don't want to say, discover new types of data that allow you to reach into domains that aren't your area of expertise because we're discovering as we learn more about the earth of how interconnected it is that we have to be able to reach off into other domains. If I'm working in hydrology, then I'm going to start to need to know about ecology and about microbial population dynamics and the food web and atmospheric uh, radiative transfer and stuff like that. 
So as we build our picture of the Earth and it gets more and more complicated, there's this drive to build systems that are confederated that know how to talk to each other. And that leads into long discussions about cyber infrastructure and standards and so forth. Um, and then the um, other aspect of, of how we work on stuff is whether to introduce things that are incremental changes to what people are already used to or to try and build something completely new and crazy and out of the blue. And uh, the harder it is to adopt, the less adoption you get. So you are motivated on the one hand to build things that are straightforward and easy and uh, inspiring to people to adopt. But then again, if you have a really good idea, then maybe the thing to do is take a chance and build it and really go way out there and ask people to kind of follow you along. And that's how these big uh, sort of innovative jumps are made in the way that we use technology. So it looks like the tour has flown to its end, and I'm going to restart it one more time just to uh, let you take another look at it, and this time I'll sort of be more narrative about the visualization piece. Actually, there's, there's two things I wanted to mention. Uh, we mentioned earlier the idea of a second paper that accompanies your first paper that's executable, and we in, in Microsoft Research Connections work closely with Microsoft Research Cambridge, that's Drew Purvis who gave the talk earlier today, and they've generated something called Fetch Climate, and they've generated something called Distribution Modeler. And these are tools that are extremely useful for people in environmental science, and particularly the Distribution Modeler is something that I want to mention in terms of provenance because it allows you to build a processing system that works on your data, and that thing can be stored uh, in the cloud and then pulled down and shared. And so it's something that you can unpack and execute and see how the data results came out of the source data. Okay, so now we're coming down into the solar system. So this is in solar system mode, uh, having flown in from the very distant galaxy view. And as we come in here, there's a little comet that's going flying up to the top of the screen. Uh, I'm introducing some uh, solar magnetic field lines. How would you do this? How would you generate this? Well, first you need a four-dimensional engine that allows you to sort of fly through time and space like this. And then you just need a data file that describes magnetic fields and then there's lastly that sort of third missing step that you need to be able to translate your magnetic field file into these lines. And so there's a little bit of a learning process there and that's what we discussed yesterday in the, uh, in the workshop. And I'll be at the demo fest today. So if you see anything here that's of interest to you and you say, gosh, how did you do that? By the way, this is the moon. The moon's not really this color, but um, that's a false color of the moon's altitude. And that's data provided by NASA. So we don't have that data. We're pulling that in as a service. Anyway, at the demo fest, if you see something that's of interest here, please come and talk to me and I'll tell you uh, how, how it was done. And now we switch to the Earth. Um, there goes Australia. And again, this is a distribution of earthquakes. And as I already described, there's a model in here of the plate boundary. And the scientist who generated that model couldn't look at it on his own software until I showed him this. And he's like, oh, this is really great. This allows me to sort of investigate my hypothesis. This insight that he has is he suspects that when you have an earthquake and it starts ripping open and tearing apart the rock and the rock's sliding past itself, that earthquake keeps propagating until it gets, reaches a part on this slab face where it has to go uphill and then it kind of runs out of gas. So he would like to do further analysis and further visualization to kind of vindicate that hypothesis um, and show that a particular event, which you can solve for as a sort of constitutive smaller events, propagates out from an initial point and then runs out of momentum or runs out of, um, stops moving when it has to work too hard to, to continue. Uh, Parker McCready at the University of Washington does uh, fluid dynamics models. So as you see, this is three-dimensional data, but it's actually four-dimensional in time. And there's a fifth dimension, which is the intrinsic color, simply whether the water is going north or south. And at this point, I'll just sort of take a chance on pausing this. And um, I'll demonstrate how you would initially work with this data is you'd put it in here and you'd sort of let it play. And then you would say, well, okay, let's go down and investigate this particular part here. And I have a little time controller that I can pop up. Let's see if we can get the right layer highlighted. Good. Okay. So that's a bit overwhelming. And the second part of my talk is actually going to be about the overwhelmingness of heterogeneous oceanographic data, uh, if I can get that far. So let's see how we're doing with uh, this. If I back out a little bit further, and I was showing this yesterday too. Um, 
at some point, one of my particles of water wanders off into this bay over here. So it's managed to become separated from everything else. And that sort of seems physically reasonable that some water is just going to kind of end up in that bay after the bay, after all the bay has water in it. And then I can eventually see that it ends up going back into the main channel here. And as it does, it has this kind of interesting little um, corkscrew motion. I'm going to move time forward a little bit further as it goes along the coastline. So that's an interesting thing to me because it asks the question, does the water going along this coastline actually corkscrew or is that a product of the model that I wrote, the software that I wrote to do this simulation? Um, one of the things that's come out of the work that we've done is that you can often see errors in your data. If your data has, maybe your sensor was uh, off calibration or your model has some kind of um, you know, nonlinearity non-linearity in it or something like that, you can kind of investigate this here and use your sort of human acuity and your um, spatial processing abilities to sort of see what's going on with that. Now, I've created a narrative story that we've been watching play back. That's actually a sequence of slides up here at the top. So the, the, the software comes with that as it's called an authoring environment. And I'll just go back and right click here. The, the, thing you do is you always right click on stuff in Worldwide Tools Telescope. So I'm going to preview the tour from here and we'll continue onwards with our, with our story. By the way, these are swishing back and forth so you can sort of guess that the time scale is about four days. It's, those are tidal fluctuations. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. Another problem that we generally face in trying to design systems is that if we build something for a particular scientist, the scientist in the office next door won't be able to use it. So how much do you focus on building platforms, generalized platforms, versus how much do you focus on verticals, you know, specific applications? And that's a, a balance that we try to strike. But we try to make tools that are not only useful for a particular research project, but also that can be adopted multiple times. So the generic ability to generate and put in a mesh, you know, that's going to apply to a lot of different uh, just domains within environmental science, we hope. And then the last thing I want to mention here is this tour started out with uh, galaxies and we're coming down here to a mass spectrometer data. So those dots are individual molecules. And they're being plotted in two different ways and I'm sort of animating the transition between those two vertical axes. So it's all the same 6,000 or so molecules, but as they transition from one view to another, uh, those views are in one case representing the mass of the individual molecules, and in, in the ca second case, they're representing what we sort of hypothesize is the isomer of a particular formula, the number of isomers of a formula. In other words, how many different ways you can build a molecule out of the, the, uh, the individual atoms. So this is uh, research into dissolved organic matter, which is a big, huge part of the Earth system because it represents sort of the fundamental grocery store that's available in the oceans to um, the microbes uh, that are living there, the autotrophs and the heterotrophs. So with that, um, I wanted to actually open up a second tour. So I'm going to halt telescope. And I'll mention a couple of other things about layerscape um, as this is happening. Um, somewhere in here I have a browser. Let's bring it across. OK. So this happens to be my wiki, um, and it has all the links from the tutorial yesterday. Uh, so if you, again, if you talk to me, you can get this URL. I want to try and give it to you right now. But it um, has a whole bunch of links for the technology that we work on. So our current, oops, sorry, I should say, the page that's going to come up is the tutorial page and it has a whole bunch of links. But rather than wait for that, I'm going to show you the Layerscape homepage. So you can build Worldwide Telescope, but how do you get it adopted and used? Well, you, you create maybe a web page that acts like YouTube for Worldwide Telescope content and allows scientists and anybody actually who can get a Windows Live ID to come here and look at the content that we've placed here, download it, play it, investigate it, experiment with the data, and the data is wrapped up in those visualizations. So, so the visualization, which we call a tour, is a little story around the data, but that actually has to contain the data as well. So Layerscape is a website, it's layerscape.org. You can install the Worldwide Telescope client using this orange button up here, and then you can install an add-in to Excel that enables you to push data into Worldwide Telescope um, easily. So the Layerscape website, if you scroll down here, 
has uh, featured content, and there's example tours here. Uh, there's an educator in Poland who uh, ha has a tour here of her kids using Worldwide Telescope to inspire some artwork, and it shows them building that. And then there's a, a workshop sort of how-to here, the fourth content on the, the home page is how you would get started using Excel to generate data, put it into Worldwide Telescope, and then, and then view it. So that's this kind of the layerscape ecosystem. Everything I'm describing is free. Um, the only cost really is the time it takes to learn how to uh, operate everything and how to get your data in. So the idea is to show the potential and then to um, uh, sort of place that out there and offer that out for, for public use. All right. So I'm just going to take a moment and open up uh, a second tour. And the, sec the purpose of the second tour here is to kind of explore um, the uh, information to insight theme of our conference or our workshop. I cannot do two things at once. So while that's loading, I'll just ask, are there any questions on what's going on so far? Everything straightforward? Okay, so it's a little tricky to sort of work backwards like this. There's a, another tour up here, but instead of hitting the play button, I'm going to actually just explore this data uh, using the layer manager. So I'm going to sort of pretend to be an ocean scientist. This is Monterey Bay off the coast of California, and we work with uh, the Monterey Bay, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, located there. And these people do experiments that generate very complicated data sets. So I'd like to try and give you a sense of what that means. Yeah, it's very calm. That's right. Toronto, Drifter. Huh? No, I'm not seeing it. This is very peculiar. Let's see what happens if I hit play here. It's too good to last. Okay, there we go. Something just clicked and everything's working now. Obviously, this is going to turn into a very complicated data set. So I'm going to turn off some of it here. Okay. So what I was hoping to show is this trajectory here. And this is a robotic submarine. It's called Tethys. It's an autonomous underwater vehicle. And as, a, as I can show it flying by here, not really. Okay, well, my system is giving me a little bit of grief, so I'm just going to have to work with it. Okay, so what you can see if you look down on this is that this uh, robotic submarine is kind of flying in or swimming through the water in circles, and as it swims, it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. So that in itself isn't too bad, but that thing has about 10 different sensors on board, so it's creating 10 different signals in time. And for example, one of the things it's calculating is the salinity of the water. So since the water tends to be sort of um, um, layered, I'm going to select a particular salinity value and start lighting up the pixels of water uh, when I measure that salinity. And if I measure a a stronger salinity and change the color, then I can get something like that, that down there. So this is physical, physical oceanography measuring the structure and the mixing of the ocean. And so far, it's still not too bad. Now, why is it swimming in circles like that? Well, it's following an environmental sensor package. 
and that thing has a, just a drifting with the currents type of a pattern that it moves in. So it's not as it's not self-directed. It's not powered. It's just drifting along. You can see what the currents are doing, and there's a little tidal stop and, and so forth. Now that environmental sensor package has on board a biology lab, and that in turn is measuring microbial populations because the ultimate goal of this research is to understand microbial population dynamics which is what the producers and the consumers, the little phytoplankton and the zooplankton, are doing out in the water. So we can also turn on those layers and see what's going on with the phytoplankton. So we have two populations of plankton, Synecococcus and Crinarchaea, and they're respectively white or kind of gold and blue here. And now I'm going to use my time control and go backwards in time. And I'm going to show how it plays forward. So it's a mess. But nevertheless, you can see that those two populations, the gold and the blue ones, are doing something kind of coherent. So I'm going to turn off the salinity ripples, turn off the trajectory of Tethys, and we'll go down here and just look at the drifter and look at those two populations of microbes. So when it starts out, the blue ones, the Crenarchaea, are very faint back at the beginning. There's not very many of them. I can fly over here and look at that. And then as we move, oops, sorry, I zoomed out too far. As we move, we move along, the Crenarchaea pick up and the Synecococcus kind of fade out. So that is something that you can investigate in terms of those robotic submarines that are swimming around and gathering data. But of course, the other thing that you can do is you can look to other data sources. And in this case, we have surface chlorophyll from a satellite and surface elevation. So if we look at that structure here, we can say, oh, look, at the very beginning here, we were kind of going around this big gyre. And in that point, that's where the blue ones were kind of faint and the yellow ones were strong. And then we kind of got into this water over here that has more um, chlorophyll in it. That's what the color means. And then suddenly the, the, the blue ones started picking up and the yellow ones started fading out. So there's a clue here as to what's driving the mi microbial population dynamics. And you can sort of imagine understanding this in terms of typical XY scatter charts and stuff like that. But what we're trying to go for here is that you can actually have this sort of three and four dimensional environment in which you can dump all these different data sets and play around with it and turn things on and turn things off. So in fact, another thing that you can do is you can create a reference frame. And I'm going to turn off this chlorophyll map. So I can create a reference frame here. Oh, thank you. I can create a reference frame and I can play back that entire experiment relative to the center of the experiment. And so this is another sort of way of giving the scientist a way of, of, of visualizing, of looking into the data set. And still it's too complicated. Still we'd have to take this apart. And the last thing that I wanted to show in here, in addition to the um, sort of reference frame centered view of the world, is um, one more little data set where we're calculating sort of a, a synthetic value and examining what the water is doing. And that's just one thing here. OK, so the last data set in my presentation today is simply the fluorescence of the water. That's an indication of how much chlorophyll there is in the water. Uh, but it's done at a particular calculation of salinity. So again, we have a robotic submarine that flies along. It measures the temperature and the salinity of the water, and it gets a density. So I, what I did was I said, OK, at a particular density, I want you to paint the water whenever you reach that density. But paint the water based on a color that's driven by the amount of chlorophyll in the water. So what we're doing is we're combining two different data signals. We're, we're actually three different data signals. Temperature, salinity, or conductivity to get water density. So the water density is then combined with the amount of chlorophyll at that point. And you can slide this around and experiment with it. But what I did was I just sort of showed all of that for four runs out and back of the submarine. So the submarine is just going out off the coast and coming back and going out and coming back. 
And then every time it hits that particular density, so think of that Z track of up and down through the water column, it paints the water the color based on the amount of chlorophyll. Now this is looking at everything at once. So if I now take this layer of data and I click the uh, tag here for time series, and now it becomes time series data. So now my time slider is active and I can move backwards and forwards in time. So here's the thing swimming out, and there's this thing swimming back and swimming out and swimming back. So that's breaking down the data in terms of time. But I wanted to point out that at, at this particular track in the beginning here, if I go down and look at it carefully, I can see that I hit those density values at just one depth in the water column. But if I move a little bit further in time, so I'll go out and then I'll come back. Here, I'm going up and down through the water column, but I'm hitting the density at two different places. So it's as if there's a lens of, let's say, higher density water in between the lower density that I'm actually measuring. Okay? And that's important because water is going to flow along constant de density gradients. So if the water is changing and bifurcating into sort of like inversion layers and splitting apart, and you can measure that with these submarines, then maybe that's going to give you insight into what the microbial population is doing and how come a population that's maybe initially monolithic could be split by this density division and sent off into two different separate currents and sent off into two different di directions. So on the one hand, you have this incredible amount of energy and uh, intellectual struggle to get just the equipment out there in the water and working and generating complex data sets like this. And then the poor guys who did all the work to do that get the data back and they're like, how do I, how do I deal with this? How do I look at it? This is just a gigantic, terrific mess. So we're trying to come along with a solution. We're trying to sort of offer them a way of getting their data into a visualization environment where they can say, okay, what about this and what about this and wire things together and explore the data in sort of the way that a human being would naturally, you know, investigate a three-dimensional and four-dimensional object. Uh, so that's one of our ongoing projects with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, so again, I'm at De Demo Fest, and I'll have this and the other things that I showed. Uh, again, everything that we're showing here is uh, available for free, and uh, we have uh, materials to learn how to use it. And then um, I wanted to mention again that the idea of data system confederation is very important to us using services, and our current work in environmental science for example, is coupling ourselves to the work that's done in, in Cambridge uh, so we can take advantage of one another's work without having to sort of rebuild and reinvent the wheel. And then lastly, uh, if I'm working on a computer and I'm thinking about stuff on my human time scale, which is sort of the time scale of a sentence or a word, then I want things to be sitting on my computer. But if I can wait, if I don't need to see it, if I don't need to have it immediately at hand, then I want it to be taken care of somewhere else because one of the biggest problems in environmental science and science in general is just data management. And so a big part of our effort as we're getting into this cyber infrastructure and the management and organization of data, data is to push stuff into the cloud. In our case, that means we use Azure and uh, it's a really exciting possibility because it gets us all kinds of things. It gives us the ability to uh, for scientists to get credit for publishing data. It allows them to aggregate larger data sets, um, data sets as people contribute data from all over the world of a particular type. And uh, basically it gets the scientists out of the business of trying to maintain computer systems and more time to focus on their actual research. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and <laughs> all set. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's always fun to watch the visualizations on this. Um, as more scientists start using this and more data sets come in, um, I, through the tutorials yesterday, you were saying there's kind of an implicit semantics with your data set, but do you have any plans to incorporate explicit semantics? Um, so auto discovery of web services that might be out there in the future so scientists can link up data that they may not know about? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. What I, what, one of the projects that we've done in the past didn't actually use this data. It used data collected by government agencies, and it, it gave you basically a geospatial search engine, so you could specify an area and a data type. It was called SciScope, and it's still uh, operating. But uh, basically, the idea of discoverability says that your data set has to be registered. You don't have to register a data set by copying the entire data set. You can simply describe it in terms of location, time, and type 
and then it becomes discoverable. So I would like to see further work done in that direction, and NSF would like to see further work done in that direction. So discoverability is like the first word out of our mouths when we're talking about the flow of what happens to data. Even though it's sort of discoverable is at the far end of it, you know, you want people to publish in a discoverable way so that their data can be reused and have more value than it was originally gathered for. So, yeah, very, very strongly agree with that. I don't see any other questions, so. I always have a question. If there's no, no other question. I'm standing in between you and your coffee break, or actually you will be as soon as I ask the question. Um, so you showed us quite a bit of data. You've been working in the field a long time. Um, can you share with us one of the exciting discoveries that was made possible by visualization that might not have been as easily to, easy to find? Well, I, I would say that the main ones I've touched on here, um, which are um, the sort of aha moment that you have when you see the structure of your data in a geospatial context. So for example, the plate boundary stuff that I was talking about. And then in this case, I think we're just at the tip of the uh, iceberg, so to speak, in, in what we can see with this data. But we're already seeing things that are falling into two categories. Number one, oh, I didn't realize that my data looked like that or that the, you know, the, uh, let's say the structure of the water could suggest so strongly how it's related to the structure of the microbial population. But then the second type of information we're seeing is, oh, that's a bug, that's a problem. That's something that shouldn't be in there and I shouldn't be spending time trying to analyze something that's just plain wrong. So again, it's you know, streamlining the process to get the paper done. Okay, thank you very much and thank you all.